Hello, and welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing different study methods you can use in law school based on your own learning style. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, the Catapult Conference, and the Trebuchet Legal Careers site. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. So as Lee mentioned, today we're going to be talking about some different ways you can study in law school and master the law. We at the Law School Toolbox believe that one method of studying the law does not work for everyone. Case in point, Lee and I actually study very differently. We're very different types of learners. So we approach study time in law school differently, but we both got great results. What is important is that you think about the best type of learning for you. Today, we're going to talk briefly about different learning styles and then talk through some different study tools and techniques that you might want to try out during the semester. So Lee, do you want to take it over? What are the basic learning styles? So there are three basic learning styles that people talk about. Uh, The first are visual learners, which are people who best comprehend things by seeing things. You need to see things written down to learn them. So if I tell you something, you're probably not going to remember it. But if I show you something, you likely will remember it. That's pretty much me. Yeah, that's pretty much Allison. (laughs) I'm really bad with names. So if somebody tells me their name, never going to remember it. But if I see it written on their name tag, much higher likelihood I will remember it. Auditory learners um, are folks who best comprehend things by hearing them. So you might find yourself having a hard time remembering what you read to prepare for class, but you'll remember a lot of what was said in lecture. And I'm a bit of an auditory learner, but I'm also a bit of a visual learner. So it kind of depends. I have to switch between the two. Um, I'm also bad with names, so I don't know what that really means. (laughs) Uh, No offense if you meet me and I don't remember your name. But um, But I never forget a face. Yes. um, So it kind of, for me, I have to play around with it and see, you know, what the material uh, really lends itself to. If it lends itself for myself being more of an auditory experience or a visual experience. And the third one, I think, oh, go ahead. I just, I think that's an important point because some people sort of dispute even this whole concept of learning styles. And they say, you know, this is ridiculous. Like people learn in different ways for different things. And I think there's some validity to that. Um, You know, we can use different techniques and arguably having more techniques in your toolbox is going to help you pick the right technique to learn a certain type of information. But I think we all do have these tendencies towards one style or the other. I mean, saying that I am a visual learner does not mean that I can't learn something from a lecture. I can still learn from a lecture. Right. It just might be less effective for me than reading. Right, exactly. And I think that really comes up uh, once you get to bar prep land as well, when people select their bar review providers, sometimes they forget how they actually really learn information. And so you might have a visual learner who spends you know, 20, 30 hours a week listening to lectures, and that doesn't necessarily lead to retaining a lot of information. Well, that's why I didn't do Barbary. The idea of sitting in a classroom for like four or five hours a day and listening to a lecture, I was like, you've got to be joking. (laughs) I would slip my wrist. Like, this is not an effective way for me to learn this material. That's for sure. That is definitely, I couldn't see you doing that at all. No. So, you know, I got the books and I read them and I made flow charts and outlines and flashcards and things. But God, I was like, this is just not an efficient way for me to learn this. Mm-hmm. But I think the, the visual learning style and then the auditory learning style, those are the two most common. The third one definitely. is the kinesthetic learning style, which is uh, definitely not as common. That's where you comprehend information best through hands-on studying or doing things. So a lot of science majors or people who really love being in science labs are really best using this learning style because they like to kind of touch things and create things, but they hate going to lectures. They don't really retain anything from lecture classes. And it's interesting. I just saw an article um, come across, I think it was my Facebook feed, about the fact that they were having kids read books while being on an exercise bike (laughs) to try and (laughs) help students who physically needed their body to be doing something to retain information. So there's this picture of like this classroom of all these adolescents (laughs) all on the stationary exercise bikes holding books, which was a little bit bizarre, but an interesting idea. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, also like get some exercise while you're reading. (laughs) For sure. (laughs) I know, right? It is a funny visual. It is a funny visual. 
And I think there's also a movement um, actually out here in Marin to incorporate standing desks into elementary school programs. Um, actually, some of my friends, uh, a former lawyer, um, she and her husband started a nonprofit to try and really move standing desks into the classrooms. Also, so kids who really need to be doing something physically with their body can learn better. And of course, the health benefits from standing as well. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on about the connection of maybe some of the folks who are kinesthetic learners, but also those of us who just need to move our bodies to be able to stay focused. Yeah, I mean, I think people are not made to sit and read for, you know, eight hours a day or whatever we're doing at this point. Yeah. Isn't it sitting there's the no smoking? Isn't that one article that was being circulated a while back? It's very bad for you. So, you know, think about ways you might be able to, uh, you know, listen to podcasts as you walk around the block, for example. Or Or Allison and I like to take our meetings on the road. We It's true. Walking meetings. We do a lot of walking meetings. Yeah. You can meet a friend instead of, you know. That's right. Our walking meetings usually end up with lunch, though. But well, I think that's fine. We've, we've worked up an appetite. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so three types of learning styles. If you have no idea what kind of learning styles you are, then we do have a link that we'll put in the show notes uh, that you can kind of take a quiz to see. But really, I think a quiz is great. But what is really important is for you to think about how in the past you've retained information. By the time you get to law school, you've been in school a long time. You remember what worked for you and what didn't work for you uh, in your previous academic experiences. Right. And I think one thing to, is interesting you say to the retained information, because I read a study recently where they were making the argument that, you know, people always say, oh, you know, I can't remember stuff. Why do I why do I forget things so easily? And their argument was because you never actually learned them to begin with. Mm. You know, so in order to forget something, you have to actually make sense of it and learn it to start with. And in a lot of cases, like with a name, for example, it's often the case that you just never actually learned it. Right. You know, somebody said it, it went literally in one ear, <laughs> out the other. Five seconds later... You would not have been able to do anything. You know, you wouldn't have known it then. So it's not like you forgot it. You just never learned it. And I think the other thing that makes learning a lot more difficult for us is this age of the technology multitasking. You know, I think this is something we've talked about in the podcast before, but we also don't pay attention to one thing at a time to be able to learn. (laughs) So, you know, again, that's your point. I mean, if you're like, wow, I read this email and I don't remember that information or I looked at this outline and I don't remember that information, but you were doing it in the midst of doing five other things. There's no way you can ask your brain to retain that information. Yeah. You have to focus and learn it before you can forget it. Yeah, that's true. Um, I will personally say uh, having a young child, sleep deprivation also does not do good things to your memory. (laughs) So I highly recommend- It's not good. No, I highly recommend you try and get some sleep in law school as one of your study tips, no matter what type of learner you are. Definitely. All right. So, Allison, what are some of the common study materials folks make in law school um, that you think have value for a majority of students? Well, I mean, the big one, obviously, is, you know, when people talk about outlining. And I, you know, from day one or even before, I'm sure law students have been told, like, oh, you have to outline. You have to outline. You're going to fail if you don't outline. It's like, well, what does that mean? Um, is this like outlining a paper? Like, you know, what exactly is this that we're talking about? And then the basic idea, ideally, in an outline is it's a document that helps you make sense of the law and kind of put the pieces together because you've read all these cases and now you have to put them together into some sort of meaningful whole. And when we say that, we don't mean put the cases or summaries of the cases in your outline. I mean, I think that's the place students usually go first, right? Why is that a terrible idea? Well, because... In the end, you're not going to be asked to have mini briefs. We call those mini briefs. It's important when you think about an outline to think about what your task is going to be at the end of the semester. And your task is going to be typically your professor giving you a fact pattern of some wild thing that happened. And then you're going to need to take those facts and apply law that you've learned from the class to those facts. The law does come out of the cases frequently, but you cannot spend time on your exam lecturing the professor on the nuances of some case that you read. They don't care. All they care about is the takeaways from that case. And so if you put your outline full of what I call mini briefs or summaries of these cases, you're going to miss the big picture, which is what is the actual law that needs to be applied to these fact patterns. And you're going to miss a ton of points on the exam because you're not going to do that analysis. You're not going to know the law to apply, and you're not going to spend time talking about how those facts relate to the law. 
Right. So, I mean, basically, what you're talking about is really learning a bunch of legal trivia. Right. It's like, oh, what's the holding of case X? What are the facts of case X? And I can see why this is confusing for students, because that's basically, in large part, what you do in class. You know, your professor's first question is, you know, what happened? What are the facts of this case? So, of course, you might think, logically speaking, oh, the facts of this particular case are super important and I have to memorize them. But that's not really right. I mean, what's important, yes, the facts, but only in the sense that that gives you a framework of the law that you can then later use on your exam. And an outline, you know, isn't necessarily the same for everyone because, you know, you might see the information slightly differently than, you know, say someone else in your study group, but the gist of it should be the same. You know, if you want to present the tort of negligence, it should look pretty similar to anybody else's <laughs> presentation. Right. I mean, if, you, if you don't have something along the lines of duty, breach, causation, harm, and damages, you're probably not really capturing negligence. Exactly. But And it could be, you know, handwritten, it could be typed, whatever you want. But like those elements kind of need to be there. Exactly. And then within those elements, you have, you know, a lot more law. So it's like, okay, well, what does duty actually mean? If I, right. if you needed to write down a rule for duty, that rule needs to be in your outline. Right. And not just the one rule, like, oh, are there different exceptions? Well, what about, a, you know, for children or, you know, exit? what about someone who is an invalid or blind? Like, how is that different? These are all the pieces that have to be there. Right. But if you're going to see that rule about like, okay, I need to know the rule for the duty if I'm a minor child, instead of giving me a whole paragraph about the case that you read about the minor child, which I think is something about a child typically pulling a chair out from somebody else. I think that's the yeah, case they yeah, always you're use. Like, um, no one cares about the details. Right, but that's not what's going to be on your exam. What's going to be, yeah, you need to know for your exam is that, you know, you, you typically have to act as a reasonably prudent child unless they're doing an adult activity. And that's the rule that should be in your outline with maybe a little mention of the fact that there was a case where a kid pulled the chair out from somebody else. Right. And then on their on the exam, you're going to get a fact pattern about like a child driving a golf cart. Mm -hmm. I mean, what comes to mind when you think about that one? It's like, oh, OK, so it's a child that tells me the child duty rule applies. Oh, but driving a golf cart, is that an adult activity or not? Huh. Right. I wonder, I wonder why my professor chose that activity. Oh, I feel like that's an ambiguous fact, Allison. <laughs> is it? Oh, I think I it mean, is. Well, shouldn't we just decide? Be like, no, golf carts are adult. No, it's debatable. It's debatable. <laughs> yeah. So the point being, having something in your outline about the details of a chair being pulled out from someone and what color the chair was does not help you analyze the golf cart situation. Exactly. So we hope that that gives you a bit of an idea of what needs to be in your outline. Cases can be included as references in your outline, uh, especially if you have a professor who likes you to use case names. Um, that is something you should find out from your professor. Some professors don't care at all and actually prefer right. that you don't reference cases. Some professors do care more. So if you're not sure what your professor's preference is, you should go to office hours and ask them. Right. And I mean, again, like a case can always be a useful shorthand because if you reference a case correctly, then your professor knows basically what universe of law you're talking about. Exactly. But you can't rely upon them too heavily. It should be like, as discussed in case X, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Moving on. How does it apply to these facts? This, you know, this situation is different because this situation is similar because on balance, although it's a close question, I believe the court would decide blah, blah, blah. Right. Because... That's that's the framework we're talking about. Exactly. So I think that the computer has made outlining a little more challenging because people can really get sucked in to making these documents that are 50 pages, 100 pages, or, oh my gosh, even more. And you get caught up in crazy fonts and formatting. formatting and, and a word starts crashing. <laughs> exactly. Like, this is why I never outlined actually on the computer. For me, it was really important to sit down with like a blank piece of paper, a pen and some colored pencils and start to sort of make sense of the material um, in writing. And, you know, my one of my roommates would do these hundred page long outlines and she'd start with like a sample outline and then kind of add all this stuff to it. I mean, great. You know, if that works for you, more power to you. But for me, I was just like, this is just overwhelming. I can't like put it all together and it just doesn't help me. No, and actually what's interesting for me is I did the computer outlines for a number of years and 
uh, in law school. And sometimes it even start with those because they would allow me to kind of compile more information. But in the end, I realized I also needed to move to, um, I used legal pads and highlighters and pens because it, one, made me self-edit. So it prevented me from tracking, you know, all the information that could have been in my class. I didn't have time to handwrite that out. But for me, actually, the act of handwriting allowed me to learn. And there have been studies um, that Allison and I have both read that they're now showing that the act of handwriting does create memories in the brain. And so for some people, writing something out is a great way to learn. Yeah, and you, you know, not just writing it out necessarily. You can use, if, particularly if you're visual, you can use all sorts of other things. You can use color, you can use doodles, diagrams, you know, little pictures. These things might seem silly, but they're actually helping you retain and make sense of that information sometimes. Yeah, which is why you've got to experiment. You have to yeah. you know, realize what works for you. And I think what happens is you feel like you're supposed to create these 100-page outlines on your computer, and then you spend eight hours. In fact, I was just talking to someone on the phone yesterday about her experience in law school, and she says, I'm spending you know hours and hours, like eight to 10 hours trying to make this outline, and then I realized I didn't really understand what was in it. Yeah, it's easy, too, if you start with an old student outline, that can be a safety blanket for people and they feel like they understand the material, but basically they're just reading it. Mm -hmm. They're not really making sense of it for themselves. They're not writing the book on the topic. Right. And so I think that can come back to bite people, you know, when they think like, oh, yeah, I'm totally good. My outline's up to date. It's 100 pages long. Everything's in it, but you didn't actually construct it. It's not really in your brain. You can't use it. Yeah. And retyping somebody's outline <laughs> it does not, not make it your own. a good idea. Yeah, it does not just because you're you're transcribing it does not mean that you're understanding it. So another thing that I think is important to think about with outlines is you have to test your outline to see if it's actually working for you. And this is where the practice comes back into play. When you outline throughout the semester, we've talked about setting aside time each week for those deep thinking tasks, and outlining is one of them. You then want to. Do a practice hypo using that outline to make sure that you understand the law as you've written it down and you can apply it to a fact pattern, which is what you're going to need to do on the exam. And that's how you know if it's working. And if you can't do right. that, it's not working. You need to change it up mid-flight and come up with a new solution. And I think the key here is to test early. Like if you think of how software developers work, you know, they talk about having a minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. You can think about having a minimum viable outline, you know, if I had a practice hypo on this topic, what's the minimum amount of information I would probably need to start being able to write that? And that's what, you, you know, once your outline is at that point, maybe it doesn't have every single detail, you actually do the practice hypo and you see, okay, was that helpful? Yep. If the answer is yes, great, move on. If the answer is, oh no, that really didn't help at all, better to know that now. Mm -hmm. So going back to our discussion on learning styles, you know, visual learners frequently outlining is great for them. If you're an auditory learner, however, sometimes just making these gigantic documents is not going to help you really make the material your own. So we know students who've actually recorded themselves reading their outlines so they can listen mm -hmm. to it um, or lecture to your pets. I've heard that. Great idea. Or your stuffed animal. Or your stuffed animal. Or your children, if you have children. Your children. Um, so get creative. But it, if that's what you need to do to make the material your own, you need to take those steps no matter how silly you might feel doing it. Yeah, because it's really about what's going to work for you. And, you know, if you're an auditory learner, having a study group might be great because you can work with other people in your study group. And even if they don't understand what you're talking about or they might not be able to correct you, at least you get to talk through the material. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right. What about attack plans? Attack plans are something that is a term that I think gets thrown around in law school a lot, but I think a lot of people don't understand what they are. Well, an attack plan is basically your step-by-step -step framework for your answer it's not the answer. It's the questions that you have to ask in order to do the analysis. And this, you know, these are going to be a lot shorter than an outline would be. An outline has a lot more detail. An attack plan is really stripped down. It's like, you know, if you get a question on topic X, if you're taking crim law and there's a dead body on your test, which I can pretty much guarantee you there will be a dead body Probably on more than criminal one. law test. Probably yes, more at, than a one. At, at a minimum, there will be at least one. <laughs> we can pretty, there aren't too many things that are guaranteed in law school, but I can pretty much guarantee you that. Um, so the question is, what do you do? Do you have an attack plan that says, okay, if a dead body shows up, these are the steps I go through to figure out, is it murder, manslaughter, voluntary, involuntary, et cetera. Think about how helpful that would be. Yeah. And one of the ways that we encourage our students to think about attack plans is there are kind of two types. There's what we call the checklist and what we call is the roadmap. 
So for instance, let's use the, the homicide example. You have kind of this framework in your head of what you know you could possibly talk about. You may need to talk about whether this was murder. You have all these different theories of murder and you have to think about whether it could be an intentional killing, one disregard for life, um, et cetera, et cetera, felony murder. And it, you may not talk about all of those things. You may just need to talk about a few of them, but you have to have a checklist of possible issues. And that's going to help you make sure you don't miss anything when you're planning your answer. That's a little bit different than the roadmap. So going back to the example we used earlier about negligence, negligence has an attack plan and it's usually duty, breach, causation, which typically includes actual cause and proximate cause, damages, which has a whole list of different potential damages, and defenses. There are a few different types of defenses. And that is a bit more of a roadmap. Pretty much for every negligence question, you have to talk about duty, breach, causation, actual and proximate damages, defenses. Right. If you skip breach, you're not going to do very well. No. Whereas, <laughs> whereas if you have a homicide situation and, you know, murder is clearly 100% totally irrelevant because, you know, someone accidentally shot a gun that accidentally went through seven walls, you know, in that case, probably you can pretty quickly eliminate certain things. Exactly. Don't talk about an inten- intentional killing if it was a an accident. <laughs> so right. exactly. You know. So you, you get to skip pieces. You get to skip whereas, pieces. So with the negligence, you don't get to skip pieces. Exactly. So it's important that you think about when you're creating these attack plans that there are these two types and reminding yourself which type you're creating for each area of the law. And some areas of the law just lend themselves to one type of attack plan um, or another. Or even within a checklist attack plan, you might have many roadmaps. You know, if this is uh, voluntary manslaughter, I must talk about these three things. Right. Or if I'm talking about intentional torts, you know, there might be eight or 10 intentional torts that you study that are basically unrelated to each other. But once you get into one of those torts, there's specific things you need to talk about. The beauty of these attack plans is they are really the roadmap and the guide to what your answer is supposed to look like. They tell you how to do the legal analysis. And since you're being really tested on legal analysis, and that's where the majority of your points will come on your exam, that's why they're so important to have either as part of your outline or some students like to house them in a separate document or a separate notebook outside of your outline. Yeah, I think it could be good to have them in one place. You know, if it's an open book exam, you can kind of have them ready to go. If it's a closed book exam, it's far more likely you'll be able to memorize three to four pages about attack plans versus like a 30 or 40 page outline. You know, attack plans are another great thing to go to your professor and talk about if you're confused. If you don't know how the law is actually going to, supposed to be applied to a given scenario, struggle with it. Try and draft an attack plan and go to office hours and show it to your professor and say, I've been struggling with this. Is this correct? And likely they will correct it for you if you're wrong or they'll validate for you that you're right. And you're going to get points for having actually done some deep thinking work and they're more likely to help you. Exactly. All right, Allison, I know you're a big fan of flowcharts. So why don't you talk a little bit about how you use flowcharts in law school? Well, I am a big fan of flowcharts. I think they single-handedly probably saved my contracts grade my first semester because I did not like contracts. I didn't understand it. I was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what's going on here. But I basically condensed the entire course, and it was an open book exam, down to three to four pages Um, You know, starting with these sort of basic questions that you would need to analyze, like, is there a contract? Well, is there an offer? Yes or no. Is there an acceptance? Yes or no. So, you know, it was literally this, like, um, you know, I could go through the flow chart and basically just ask myself these simple questions. And I also, in this case, would reference, like, parts of the restatement that were relevant, you know, things like that. So I had everything I needed on just a few pages And it was this very simple sort of step-by-step analysis. And I actually did surprisingly well in that class. And I think for some people, flowcharts really clarify kind of almost an attack plan type approach. Yeah. I mean, they're really, they're very hard to make. You know, if you make, if you try to out, if you try to make a flowchart of say the entire course or like a concept in a course, you'll actually find that, you know, in some cases I look at my what I made and it's quite funny because I'll have marked things out and like, you know, corrected some subtlety after talking to my professor or something, but it really can pinpoint those areas that you're not quite clear on. Mm -hmm. So again, this is where the deep thinking tasks come. You know, you can work on these flow charts throughout the semester, you know, building it out, or it's a great thing to do as you get towards the end of the semester to see if you truly understand how the material fits together. 
What I think is, is uh, important too to actually really make them a flow chart. I've occasionally seen student things that they send say, oh, here's a flow chart. And it's like, this is not a flow chart. This is just a brain dump. Mm-hmm. You know, it has to have that logic of like they're, you know, I mean, this is flow charts came from computers. It's literally binary. Like you have to answer yes or no at every point. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have those sort of yes or no questions leading to more questions, it's not really a helpful flow chart. That's probably why you're a good computer coder. Well, there's a lot of overlap. It's just logic. <laughs> you know, you think of the logic gates flip up or down. It's the exact same thing you're doing with your law. You know, it's interesting. I didn't really use flowcharts very much and still I, until I started working around a bunch of developers. And then they wanted me to make them training flowcharts or implementation flowcharts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, not everything in the world can be condensed down to a flowchart. But what you can condense down is really useful to do so. Because everybody, I mean, you can answer... You know, basically, you can answer yes, no, or maybe to pretty much everything mm-hmm. on a law school exam. That's all you're doing. Very true. And this is, again, another great tool for visual learners. Um, mm-hmm. I think probably more visual learners than auditory learners, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But even for an auditory learner, if you have a open book exam, <laughs> a flowchart yeah. can be very helpful. So Borrow it from your visual friend. Exactly. Yeah. It, does, it won't do you quite as much good as if you made it yourself, but it can still be helpful. Exactly. And some supplements actually do include flowcharts in them. So that's something... Yeah, I'm always so excited when I turn the page of a supplement and I'm like, yes, there's a flowchart. <laughs> so that's one thing to think about if you uh, can make your way over to a physical bookstore or your library where you can flip through some supplements and see if they have flowcharts. That can be really helpful as well. Yeah. All right. I'd like to talk about how much I hate flashcards, even though I know Go a for lot it. of people love them. Um, I personally just... I've hated flashcards since spelling tests back in the day <laughs> when my mom would encourage me to make flashcards. I have never learned from them particularly well at all. And at every point of my education career, I have seemed to decide that I need to make them. And then they are a huge waste of time. And then they go in the trash or in the recycling. Yeah. All the way leading up to the bar exam. I'll be honest. I made a whole bunch of flashcards for a couple of days and then realized I was learning nothing from them and recycled them all. Yeah, I made some for torts my first semester because our professor told us he really wanted us to know like the details of, say, 20 different cases or something. And so I made these flashcards and I put like the case name and some facts about it. I even drew like a little picture and colored it and they were useless, <laughs> totally useless. I think the thing about flashcards, why they're such a danger and why I warn students about them is you can just spend so much time making them that you can convince yourself that you're studying when you're actually not. Well, I think, too, the problem is, I mean, compare flashcards to flowcharts. Flashcards, they really encourage this kind of like atomized behavior and atomized way of thinking that students are already susceptible to because they're so obsessed with reading and remembering cases. It's that same kind of thinking. Like, I just have to remember if I could just remember everything on these cards, like I'll be fine. Versus a flow chart where you're really trying to integrate all of that material. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, making flashcards is easy. Making a flow chart is hard. Right. Memorizing flashcards is pretty easy, relatively speaking. Yeah. And so, you know, there, as you said, it can just take an inordinate amount of time. Yeah. So unless you really, really, really find learning from flashcards to be the way to great grades for your entire educational career, I would not spend time doing them. I mean, I think they could be helpful for memorizing specifically as a task. Right. If there's a bunch of stuff you have to memorize. They're a decent way to memorize things. But that's not really what most of law school is about. So I just, I, yeah, again, I, I agree with you. I really caution people against relying on them for other things. So the one thing I have, I've read and that I think actually is a place where the flashcard might have a lot of value is for the kinesthetic learner, the learner who really needs kind of a physical activity that um, is linked to the learning task. And so some kinesthetic learners can benefit from flashcards because they have the act of like physically flipping them over. Well, and I think you can do things too, where like, you know, you're not just doing one at a time. Like flashcards could be useful if you have different pieces and then you move them around on a table or on the floor or like on your bed Mm -hmm. and kind of start seeing the connections. I think that could be helpful if you're a very kinesthetic learner. But just that sort of like flipping... Do I remember what's on the back of this card? Yes. Do I remember what's on the back of that card? Yes. Right. Not so helpful. Not so helpful. <laughs> exactly. So just be warned, you know, don't let it become kind of the black hole of your study time. That's, that's what really yeah. the biggest, biggest warning. But then there are mnemonics, which I'm a fan of as long as they really work. Did you use a lot of mnemonics in law school? 
No, um, I mean, I understand the benefit in theory, but from I just never got that into them. Yeah, I would only use them for certain things. I remember torts specifically. We had a lot of really long factor tests. And yeah, we had you had close. I did exams too, which also made me have more mnemonics. So yeah, so I we didn't have to memorize so much. I could just look at it. Yeah, so mnemonics can be helpful. Again, I think people get crazy with them and spend way too much time coming up with these rhymes that they then can't remember or cannot remember what they actually mean. Um, so just make sure that the mnemonic, and if you don't know what a mnemonic is, it's a song or a rhyme or some sort of a shortcut uh, to learning something. Or like a word or like letters that mean right, something. Right, letters that you can put together to mean something. Like Roy, Roy G. Bibb for the colors in the rainbow. Yeah. So again, if you learn this way, if it helps you memorize, spend time on it, but it It can just become a huge time suck, so don't get carried away. Make only enough mnemonics that you can remember. I remember one of my friends in law school showing me his list of mnemonics, which was just completely unreal, and he was struggling memorizing his mnemonics to memorize the rest of the material. It's like, no, 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 no. That's too much. (laughs) Well, like sometimes, again, like sometimes it's helpful that, you know, there's some pretty well-known mnemonics for certain, you know, concepts, and you know, borrow one that already exists if that works for you. Yes. But again, like, don't kid yourself that, you know, borrowing your friend's list of 100 mnemonics is really going to help. No. And there are some, I mean, the first one that comes to mind for me is in contracts. You have the statute of frauds is my legs is the mnemonic for that. Everybody learns my legs. Don't spend time learning another mnemonic for that. Yeah, I have no idea what that means. You don't? Didn't you learn the statute of frauds? My list? Yeah, but I didn't memorize. I had my flow chart. Oh, my worry. gosh. <laughs> you and your open book exams. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, if I didn't have a statue of frauds, I'd have a yes or no checklist of questions that led me through the analysis. Well, <laughs> my professors weren't as nice as yours were, and I had to learn all that stuff cold. I probably knew it at some point for the bar. Probably deep down in the back of your brain somewhere. So for auditory learners, though, these can be great because you can – you know, hear them. You can say them to yourself. You can record them. Yeah. Isn't there even, there's some like learn the law, like song podcast. I don't know if it's like there downloads some, yeah, or something. Yeah, there is something like that um, that I think it's mostly for the bar exam. But yes, they've made songs about the law. I mean, people are getting really creative. So you should do some research and find some resources. Yeah, find some YouTube videos of like people singing about torts. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Or make up your own songs. Hey, if you're a musician and you want to write a tort song, <laughs> Send it to us. We'll put it up on the blog. I'm just saying. It's going to be the next viral sensation. It could be. Um, And for those kinesthetic learners that kind of need that extra, like, physical connection with it, singing a song can maybe help you learn a little bit better. With motions? You could dance? Oh, you could dance. Now that... In the privacy of your own home? Exactly. And then you could visualize the dance in the exam, because I think that could be a little distracting. Right. Yeah. Unless it's a take-home exam, then dance away. Dance away. Dance in your head. Exactly. All right. Well, is that pretty much the summary of the major study materials that we saw people do in law school? I mean, I think that's most of what we've got. Yeah. yeah. You know, people do crazy things like trying to pre-write pieces of the exam and stuff. But I mean, you know, these are the point is, you know, you have a bunch of different resources to use and you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Yeah. You know, you can do something that makes more sense to you because ultimately what it really comes down to is what are you getting down on the exam, on exam day, and no one really cares how you prepared for it. It's true. Can I do one word of warning, though, about that pre-writing parts of the exam? Sure. So I know that this is popular, especially for take-home and cl- open book exams, and I don't necessarily think it's a terrible idea. And this is the idea of, like, you know, you basically write the framework of an answer, and then you just plug in the analysis as it pertains in the question I've seen it work well, but I've also seen it be disastrous because what can happen is people get so caught up in what they think they're supposed to write about is they actually forget to read the question carefully and answer the question asked. Right. They're like, yes, this was about personal jurisdiction. Let me go. I got this one down. (laughs) Exactly. And actually, it's not entirely what you're being asked. And then you do really, really poorly on the test. And so, you know, having like this is great, but you didn't answer the question. Right. So having some of these you know, tools at your disposal on an open book exam is not necessarily a terrible thing, but don't be rigid about it and don't jump to conclusions. Still make sure that you're focusing on what your professor is asking you to do and you're writing the answer that they want. Also, just spending a huge amount of time typing down, you know, long, long, long rule statements on an open book exam is not going to get you a bunch of points because everyone in the room 
has the same thing. That's not going to differentiate (laughs) you from the person sitting next to you. What's going to differentiate you is your issue spotting and your analysis. And you cannot write that down going into the exam. You have to be able to do that in the classroom. Yep. All right. So I just had to get that out because that's one one that really bugs me. Yeah. Understand. Yeah. Okay. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and ratings on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon.